What's up guys, my name is Devin and welcome back to the Lifting and Rigging channel. This video is actually the ending to our two-part series on fall protection systems for roofers. In this conversation, I'm joined by David Ivey from Multidynamics, David Vivas and Travis Carew from Mozilla FHS Fall Protection out of Florida. In this video, we break down regulations, we break down enforcement of fall protection, and we break down different considerations that you should undergo before specking out which fall protection system you need for your roofers. For the various systems, when do you see them working the best? Maybe let's start with the bucket. Like when when does the bucket system work the best for uh, roofers? So residential, when you've got a, a a number of workers up on a on a small roof, um, and and it's got a peak or a pitch, it's got a pitch. Um, you you want to use this roofing kit um, as opposed to like a grabber system. That's going to be that can be residential, but more geared towards the commercial side from from what we see out in the field. You'll see a lot of the residential home builders slash roofing companies will use that bucket, but a lot of your general contractors that are doing the big warehouse buildings or they're doing the, the big remodels on existing buildings, they would lean more towards that grabber system. So if you would like on a two-story building, if he was doing gutter work or fascia work, window work, the grabber's ideal for that, okay? and because uh, you're working over the edge of the roof. And uh, so the grabber will get it, or just an HVAC system that's barely over the edge of the roof, just a couple feet inboard. So that's where the grabber really plays a, a good part. Uh, so then you start getting into other systems. Travis hit on the bucket kit earlier. Um, best use for that is to always use it in fall restraint, as he said. Um, so when you're when you're working on the roof, if you know the you know, the roof's edge is let's say 10 feet from the anchor point, you need to have that you know your your um, your rope grab adjusted to let's say you know six feet, seven feet, so you can't fall, you physically can't fall over. So if you were to you know walk over there and try to fall off that edge, you you can't. Um, so as we talked earlier, the hierarchy of controls. If you can, you know, remove the hazard or, you know, work in restraint over arrest. Fall restraint is best case scenario over fall rest, uh, fall rest always. To me, it seems like either it's the worker on the roof more so than the contractor who's running the shop that just doesn't seem to worry all that much about the fall protection. We see the, the contractors, the, the roofing companies providing safety equipment for these workers. But, but what happens is these workers feel like, you know, we've talked to a few of them, they feel like it slows them down. Um, especially here in Florida, it's very hot. And, and those guys have a hard job on top of those roofs. It can be up in 100 degrees and they're working on a black roof and they are burning up. So to put an extra harness on, that, that bothers them or slows them down, they say. And so I don't necessarily know if it's the, the companies. I, I think it's more so guys have been working on these roofs for a number of years and they've never fallen. But it only takes one fall. So that's why we stress to these guys, one slip. Um, and you land land the uh, the wrong way, and something could happen. So we go look at the fines and the fatality charts, which falls are the highest percentage of fatalities with OSHA. But we see sometimes the same roofing companies been fined time and time and time again, and it's almost as if they built that into the cost of doing business. But like Travis says, it's cumbersome. I can remember in the steel industry, structural steel workers, they were reluctant to get into safety because they wanted to not be encumbered while they were walking still and putting still in. So it's like Travis says, a lot of people fought being encumbered by these systems. Uh, so it's a safety's hard pill to chew for a lot of companies and employees. And they almost gotta get in trouble first before they exercise anything. Uh, so that's some of my observations over the years. And what about you, David Ivy? Especially since you spend a lot of time kind of informing people about the new products that you, you guys have made over at Malta, when you're kind of talking to different people on sites about the different configurations of fall protection that you guys offer, what's some of the pushback you get from roofers? Like uh, Travis had said, it's too hot. I just, I feel like this is gonna slow me down. Like what kind of things are you seeing when you're out talking to people about fall protection? A lot of it we run into on our side is 
it's product awareness. Um, a lot of the people out there, um, they know they should wear a harness. Um, a lot of it's proper training. They they may know they need to wear the harness. They don't know how to wear the harness. They know they need an anchor point. They don't know how to install the anchor point. Um, so a lot of it you see is uh, non not proper training, um, and a lot of that you know starts at the top. Um, so. We, we see that a lot um, and then a lot of it as Travis said they say it slows them down you know I've been on this roof for you know I've been roofing for 25 years um, I've never fallen um, all this is going to do is slow me down it's not going to help me any um, so they don't a lot of people see safety as a you know a cost um, they don't see the benefit to safety um, so that's one of the big things is to let them you know you got to make sure they realize that you know, if somebody takes a fall, you know, you're looking at hundred thousand, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars possibly, um, or more, uh, depending on the situation. Um, and not only that cost, David, that's, that's good to bring up, but what they're leaving behind, what they're doing to their family. They've got young kids, you know, they can't get out there in the yard and throw the ball around anymore because they've got a serious back injury or, you know, they can't get back to work after they get hurt. So it's, it's one shortcut, you know, you're one shortcut away from, um, you know, hurting yourself as well as your family, as well as your employer. Um, so it's, uh, it's definitely a ripple effect um, that you'll see if you, if you do take a fall off a roof and you, you had the opportunity, you'll be kicking yourself if you had the opportunity to wear a body harness and for whatever reason you left it in the bed of your truck that day because you wanted to hurry. Um, that's just a, it, it's just a shame. Travis and David both, you guys kind of raised two different points. So David Ivey, you were kind of talking about how some of this has to do with leadership, not really reinforcing the importance of like training or fall protection. And then uh, Travis, you had mentioned that there's an issue with sometimes roofers just want to leave their, their harness in the car and then get straight to work. So where does responsibility fall? Who's the one that's supposed to take ownership for fall protection on a job site? Is it supposed to be that contractor? Is it the company that's over top of that contractor? Or is it the roofer in question? to make sure that they're wearing the harness that's provided. Where, where does the onus fall? Should be the roofing company themselves, their superintendent. Uh, also, but if they're a subcontractor for some a GC, you, are, you go on somebody's site, some company's site, they can be ultimately responsible for ensuring that you're following OSHA standards. But the onus should be on the GC or the company they're working for. And, uh, but it goes all the way down the line to all the medium level supervisors and everybody else that's responsible for the safety of individuals on the job site. You know, it starts at the top. Um, you know, if, if OSHA comes on site, you know, they're, they're generally not going to write the ticket to, you know, Johnny working on a roof. Uh, the ticket's going to go to the company. Um, so ultimately, it's the company's responsibility to make sure their workers are trained um, and they're enforcing, you know, the rules and regulations put forth by OSHA um, to ensure the workers are safe and following uh, procedure. That's the sad part about um, being a fall protection specialist or salesman or designer is most of the calls you get are after the fall. So you, you, you always hope that somebody's ahead of the game. Hey, we're going on this roof in um, you know, July. In June, let's plan on how to protect these people so that when July hits, we're up there, we've got a game plan, we've got the proper harnesses that we've purchased from a company like Malta or, you know, from FHS Mozilla and kits. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of kits out there and we're gonna touch on that uh, very shortly that make it simple. Everything you need is in a five gallon bucket. All you've gotta do is put that bucket in the truck or vehicle, whatever vehicle you're in and uh, it, open it up and go through step by step what those the user manual tells you to do and you're going to keep yourself safe so it's um it's it, it, we're doing our best to to get in front of this incident you know instead of getting the call after uh, we want to we want you guys to think about it beforehand All right, so before we go into the different products available to roofers, I wanted to go into regulations because um, David Vivas, you were kind of saying that there's a lot of people who use different subcontractors and they might think that the rules might apply differently because we talk about that too. You know, what, you have your company, but then you have your installers, which is a third party person. And so there's some a little bit of disconnect between who's overseeing what. Is it the company that's being installed or is it the company that hired the installer to do it? So I want to go into regulations, like what specifically with fall protection applies to roofers roofers as to whether or not they need fall protection, if they should or shouldn't use fall protection, I'd like to go there for a little bit. CFR 29, section 9, 1926, go through the subparts. 
and look at all the responsibilities and how to achieve those things. That's the regulations. Uh, but there's a, there's a lot to cover there. Uh, so it's good to get with somebody like us or David A. Ivy from Malta because we can help you walk through all those areas. Now, when you guys are out kind of working with companies, what kind of stuff are you seeing as far as like mom and pop configurations of like, hey, we just threw something up because we thought this was gonna work, but maybe this isn't quite what we need. What kind of stuff are you seeing out there of people just trying to do the best they can, but maybe missing the mark a little bit? People just going through some motions. Uh, they have no engineering. They really, they've seen a lifeline in somebody's facility or something. They think it's just simply throwing up a wire rope, okay? So you'll go into maybe a mobile home plan and you'll see a wire rope strung out 180 feet from one curling on one side building to one on the other side, and you'll see six foot of sag in that wire rope and six people attached to it, but shingles on the roof of a modular home or something, knowing darn well that they're all gonna hit the floor if somebody falls. But to them, they've made the effort, I think, but they haven't got into the bones of it, they haven't looked up the, uh, the calculations, the, and the various ocean ANSI rigs on this stuff. They haven't done any homework at all on it. So the general rule is four foot or higher um, in general industry, you've got to be protected. In construction, it's six feet or higher. And there's not many homes, um, businesses, et cetera, that you can get on a roof and be less than six feet off the ground. I just, um, you, you just don't see that very often, at least not here in our region. Um, so most of the time, if you see someone on a roof, and they're not in a harness or they're not attached to some type of system or in a in a lift um they're breaking that uh they're breaking that law and sometimes they have the attitude i only need to be up here for 15 or 20 minutes so there's no sense of getting all that stuff on and putting an anchor in and all this stuff they think i'm only gonna be i'm gonna be up, up here and die that's you know? the most common how long does it take to don a harness if you're good at it 30 seconds so if you're watching this video and you are a roofer and you have a bad habit of leaving your harness in the truck, I want you to think about what Travis just said. 30 seconds can change your life, legitimately change your life. Um, so what about you, David Ivy? What kind of stuff are you seeing out there in the field when you're you know, seeing people just kind of manufacture something just to try to keep them compliant, but maybe it's not quite up to up to snuff? You see a big uh, break in between it. So you you have the companies out there that want to be compliant and they're trying. They, they're honestly, you know, they're honestly, they want their, their people safe um, and they want compliance, but ultimately at the end, they're like, is are my work workers safe? Um, so it's nice when you have those companies out there that reach out and they're like, hey, we want to make sure these guys are safe. And compliance is the second thing. So yeah, you want to be compliant, but as a company, your main your main role should be, are my workers going to go home at the end of the day? Um, and then you know look at the laws and regulations to make sure it all meshes in the end. Um, so you see that, um, but a lot of times you see people that say hey, what can we do to make sure that we look compliant? Um, so you have a lot of companies that will buy these, uh, the bucket kits as Travis mentioned earlier, who will buy those and put them in the bed of their truck and leave them in the bed of the truck because if OSHA were at the show up on a job site, they have something they can throw up real quick to make it look like they're using it. So you, have, you see that a lot, um, which is unfortunate. Um, because you have it there, um, you might as well use it. There's no, there's no sense of not using it when you already have it. Um, so we, we see that a lot and a lot of the time in the roofing industry, just because they're so comfortable being up there on the roof. You know, it's, you know, you don't think about safety when you're walking down the hallway at your, your office and that's their office. Um, it's on top of that roof. And that's the way they feel is, you know, they're comfortable there. They do it every day. Um, so they don't need anybody impeding on them. That's a really good point that, you know, somebody just thinks, hey, I do this day in and day out. I'm on that roof every single day. I, I know what it'll feel like before I fall, but they call it an accident for a reason because you don't plan for it and it happens when it happens. And that sucks. And that's, that's the purpose of this conversation, just to get a better understanding about what's available to you, just so we can help you stay a little bit safer on that roof. Well, before we close down, do you guys have any other final thoughts about fall protection systems, specifically for roofers that maybe we haven't touched yet uh, that you'd like to touch on? Just to look at the applications and see if we can do it uh, uh, passively or if we have to do it uh, actively, uh, you know, whether we can do it with guard railing or whether we can uh, do permanent anchorages or temporary anchorages. Uh, we just want to get involved with the end users to see what's best for them. And that's often driven by economics of the end user or how long the job's going to be. There's a lot of variables involved in fall protection and fall restraint. 
so we have to approach customers with our eyes wide open. And so if people do need uh, further help or if they want to ask you guys questions, I guess I'll start with uh, David and Travis. How do they reach out to you guys if they need more help or if they want to learn more about fall protection and doing everything you know in a more safe and compliant way? Just uh, hop on the FHS Mozilla website. Um, tons of great information there. You can find our phone numbers and our emails to get in touch with us um, or give us a call at the office here. Um, we just want the opportunity to help you guys. So we appreciate uh, you listening today. And if there's anything we can ever do for you, we really want the opportunity to uh, to help you guys out if we can. So thank you very much. Cool. And then David Ivey, uh, we talked a lot about the grabber. We, you showcased that bucket system. If people wanted to learn more about your company, your products, or just to get in touch with you for more information, um, where do they go? How do they do that? So we have uh, a lot of our standard products on multadynamics.com. So you can find a lot of that there. Um, now we did actually just launch a website this week uh, for the grabber specifically. So you can find information on the grabber specifically at mdgrabber.com. So it'd be like multidynamicsgrabber.com. Um, so that'll have all of our contact info on there um, on all the websites. So give us a shout. Um, we're always available. Um, cell phones are on hand. So if you're on the weekend, you get something stumped, give us a call and there'll be somebody able to assist you. That's awesome. So Travis and the two Davids, I really do thank you for your time. Um, we we went longer than I thought we were going to because we were having an awesome conversation. This is exactly the conversation that I hoped we were going to have today. So thank you three gentlemen for joining us. Uh, for all of you guys watching at home, I really hope that this was informative and beneficial to you. The one thing I want you to really take away is how passionate each three of these guys are about your safety. They want to help you. They're not trying to upsell you. They're not trying to get one over on you. They want to make sure that you're safe. They want to make sure that you're compliant. And these are some of the best people that you can work with to make sure that you and your workers are kept safe and compliant on that job site. So if you guys need any help, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to help you however we can. Again, my name is Devin. Thank you for watching the Lifting Rigging channel. We'll see you next time.